We will dive right in with the first reform. The first reform is on fixing current primary election systems with ranked choice voting. And we have Rob Ritchie of Fair Vote, who will make the six-minute case, followed by two minutes of rebuttal time by Peter Rosenstein. Thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, so we have an online audience also that can be voting and just, uh, so you can follow this at nationaldemocracyslam.com. Uh, and the papers are posted and, uh, and you can, you'll be able to vote instantly afterwards. So I won't use that as part of my six minutes. So in today's era of polarized politics, primaries can seem like the culprit for much of what is broken. That's because given the combination of more intensely partisan voting patterns and the big sort of partisans dominating more places, few general elections are meaningfully contested. Last, no last November, fair vote projected winners in six out of every seven congressional races in 2016. That's more than two years later, using a methodology that was right in 699 of our last 700 projections. Nationally and state legislative races, more than four in 10 um, don't even draw two uh, major party candidates. Um, here's a stat. In, in several chambers in the South, including both in Georgia, not a single state legislative district is represented by someone who, who represents a district that their major party presidential nominee uh, uh, won in 2012. So complete, perfect partisan polarization. So that means the general elections essentially are decided, so then the primaries mean everything. And yet in, in most states, uh, or in many states at least, primaries are closed um, to uh, only people who are registered with that party, even though today a plurality of, of, of new registrants, uh, uh, registered voters don't register in major parties. So the backers of the top two primary, which is now done in California and Washington, see that reform is breaking open this calculus. Every uh, candidate runs against every other candidate in the primary, and then the top two face off in November. Um, and that opens the primary election. But here's the thing, is it doesn't really open the general election, and the general elections stay non-competitive. And, and so just a few stats from, from the top two, and my paper goes in a lot more detail. Um, and anecdotal evidence like this isn't the be-all, end-all, but it's important to, to keep facts in mind. So California actually had the biggest decline of any state in turnout from the 2010 to the 2014 elections. Um, the primary turnout remains very low and very unrepresentative. A lot fewer um, unaffiliated voters and young people vote in primaries and general elections. That hasn't changed. Uh, the parties are really working it quite well. In Washington State, there's 56 top two races that they've had for Congress in statewide races, and there's only been a single one where, the, where there were two people of the same party that advanced. So generally, it's just a Democrat versus Republican lopsided final outcome. Third parties and independents, though, are now almost completely shut out from the November ballot. And polarized voting patterns actually haven't changed much in the legislature. In fact, California had the single most polarized legislature in 2013, and Washington State was number four. So we think we should do a couple things. First, we should advance more than two, so have a top four primary. So that really opens up the range of candidates that, that can get to that important general election ballot where there's a lot more voters. And then to handle having four voters, four candidates rather, use ranked choice voting. We'd also like to see the parties have more association rights protected, which I've talked about in the paper. So ranked choice voting for those who are new to that idea is one where voters don't just vote for one person, but they get to rank candidates in order of preference. You get to say your first choice, then you get to say a backup second choice and your backup third choice. Use those rankings to simulate what you would do if the voters kept coming back and you always drop the last place candidate after each round. It's an instant runoff where your ballot counts for your second choice if your first choice candidate has lost by being in last place. So when you do that, dropping the last place candidate, the fourth place finisher in a top four race would be eliminated, then you get down to three and then down to two. You uh, really change incentives for, for, for what voters um, do, and, but also for what candidates do. Rather than just focusing on first choices, you have to think about second and third choices and when you think about this different mix of candidates that are going to include far more often two people of the majority party in the district as well as third parties and independents, they have to just work harder. They have to really actually represent the constituency that they ultimately are going to represent. Ranked choice voting is used. It's, it's been adopted now in, in more than a dozen cities. It's used in uh, Minneapolis, Oakland, San Francisco, a long international history. Um, lots of colleges use it. In fact, I think even WSL's 
law students used to at least at one point, but more, more than 50 do. Here's just a quote from the mayor of Portland, Maine, who, uh, Maine, by the way, will have a chance to vote on ranked choice voting statewide in 2016, but he's a very experienced candidate, run for Congress, been a Senate Majority Leader, and he said that running ranked choice voting was very different than anything he'd done before. This is a direct quote. You're not only trying to get a number one vote, you're trying to get a number two vote or a number three vote. I really ended up focusing on all Portland voters as opposed to just looking at targeted voters. I didn't care if they were Democrats, Republicans, or Independents, but generally speaking, you really tried to reach out to as many as you possibly could. We've been part of a comprehensive new study of this in action in um, the seven cities with, with ranked choice voting that, that were uh, tested uh, compared to, to, to cities without in 2013, 2014, and that was uh, found to be duplicated. So backers of the top two primary fingered an important factor. Traditional primary system is broken, but rather than try to rescue primaries that we believe are fundamentally being rejected, we should make general elections open and relevant. Top four expands voter choice in November, preserves the right of unaffiliated voters to participate in all elections, and creates new incentives for winners to reach out to more voters and be well representative. Even states that want to keep primaries intact would greatly benefit from keeping RCV as Maine shows uh, or as this opportunity for, for Mainers to pass it next year. Uh, but this is something that, that states can do for Congress. And so we're, we're, we're saying that if we want to fix congressional elections, a big step forward would be for states to act to do the top four, four primary with ranked choice voting. Thanks. Uh, good morning. Uh, you get a test now. Do you understand ranked choice voting? Um, that's part of the major problem with ranked choice voting. It is having people understand it. It doesn't increase voting turnout. And the reality is that it doesn't even get a true majority. It gets a majority of the voters who came out and whose ballots weren't what we call exhausted. So you could still have the winner of ranked choice voting have only 34% of the people that voted initially be that person. I'm a traditionalist. I believe in party primaries. The question today is we have a lot of people registering as independent. The question you need to ask them is, what do you believe in? What is an independent? Uh, we had that in Washington, D.C. this year. We had an independent candidate who left the Republican Party because he wanted to keep his seat on the council, couldn't have if he hadn't left the party or become a Democrat. So I don't have a problem with traditional party primaries. I also have a problem with us worrying about what it costs to fund party primaries. I think whatever it costs is worth it. We need to get people out to vote. We need to educate them. Think about, you couldn't understand what was just said. Think about the average person trying to go into a ballot box and understanding ranked choice voting. That's why the, um, in Tacoma, Pierce County repealed it back in 2009 in Minneapolis, where they projected 60% vote in ranked choice primary, they got about a 35% vote. The exhausted ballots are so big that in studies done by uh, Burnett and uh, Kogan, one of Ohio State, they looked at that and said, you don't get this true majority. It's a fallacy. There aren't many states and cities who have it. What no one has done, and some people talk about the fact that more people will like the result. You know, the second place person, oh, I feel better about that because he or she was my second place. I tend to think no one's ever studied that. And in most cases, you don't feel that. You had a candidate, you wanted to see that candidate win. If that candidate loses, you don't feel a lot better about the next candidate. Uh, there is a bump for any winner. It's a natural kind of thing. But ranked choice voting doesn't help any of that. It just makes it more complicated. In Oakland, California, they took a look at it and found that poor and minority populations voted less, not because they weren't smart enough, but because the complications of ranked choice voting was even more complicated. If you've ever tried uh, touch tone voting, you find out that we still have paper ballots. Are we going to move back to only paper ballots with ranked choice voting? It sounds like we're going backwards. And yet, by touch, touch machines, People have a hard enough time doing that first vote, and then the thing's going to pop up and say, now, who's your second choice? Who's your third? You have to have studied those candidates to have a rational choice. And people don't. This just makes it more difficult, not less difficult, to get people out to vote. Let's spend our money in educating people and getting them out to vote. Do you need education on ranked choice voting? Yes, if you do it. 
You better have great education. It's hugely expensive to let people understand what this means. It's an entirely different system. I don't think it's a worthwhile system to look at. I believe in runoff primaries. I believe in runoff elections. That, I think, is the way we should be going. So I'll be very quick in my response. Thank you, uh, Peter. And um, so uh, I'll just say there are some really important facts related to this to uh, keep in mind. Um, for instance, Oakland uh, has 18 offices elected by ranked choice voting. They used to have the, the runoff system that Peter prefers. And 16 of those offices, when they first elected ranked choice voting, the winner had more votes than they had had in the previous system. Right? So more people actually are participating. All the elections always happen in November, where you have a much more diverse electorate. Um, on the diversity front, San Francisco also has 18 offices elected by ranked choice voting, and 16 are held by people of color now, which is a big jump from when they didn't have ranked choice voting. Um, and uh, as far as voters handling it, um, they are. Like in Oakland, in the first time they used it for mayor, uh, 299 out of every 300 voters cast a valid ballot. Um, and in fact, they were 10 times more likely to make an error in the top two primary when they first used it than when they used uh, ranked choice voting. Um, so I think that we, we certainly can see it working well, um, and uh, we are seeing voters like it. There's uh, uh, the, the study of, of, of RCV cities using it shows that uh, a majority of voters in every city with it support keeping it. So thank you.